hello friends so so having considered the different laws of thermodynamics in a generalized framework in the previous lecture we moved into employing this understanding of thermodynamics to study the change in the state of a specific form of a system this system is the material that we are interested in now instead of considering a wide range of materials we rather focused on one particular form of a material so this characteristic feature of this particular form of material is that it is made up of the chemical composition of this material or the chemical makeup of this material is that it comprises of a single form of a component so when we say a component that constitute a material this component could be an ion it could be an atom or it could also be a molecule so irrespective of the nature of the component and given that the material that we are interested in comp is comprises of or it comprises of this single form of the component now when we have such a material often the change in the state or uh, the change that we observed in such a material or in such a system is the change in its state so what we mean by the change in the state is the change in its rather the conventional state that is solid liquid and gas so when we consider the change in the state of such a system such a material that is made up of a single component it is often the change in its state now we saw while considering the different thermodynamic functions that can be employed to describe the change in the state of a system for materials it is often one thermodynamic function that is largely adopted and this thermodynamic function that is adopted is the gibbs free energy one of the reason why the gibbs free energy is adopted to describe the change in the state of a material is because the variables that are associated with the gibbs free energy are often the ones that can be rather played around with in a laboratory condition so if you could uh, consider the expression for the gibbs free energy as a thermodynamic function that is associated with a specific thermodynamic variables the variables include temperature and pressure in a laboratory setting it is rather straightforward for us to change the temperature and pressure when compared to the other thermodynamic variables for instance entropy or even in some cases volume so given that these two variables are rather straightforward for us to manipulate in a laboratory setting while performing our experiments we often employ the corresponding thermodynamic function to describe the change that occurs when we change these thermodynamic variables now in addition to considering the material or in addition to employing or introducing the thermodynamic concepts to understand the change in the state of the material in previous lecture we also consider the concept of driving force so whatever may be the change that occurs externally that brings about a change in the state of a system or a state of a material internally there can be certain variables that can be considered as or there can be change in certain variables that can be considered as the driving force for this change in the state of the material so one example one rather easily understandable example that we saw in our previous lecture was the freezing of what a ball of water so when we place a ball of water in the freezer there is a temperature difference between its surrounding and the ball of water so this introduces a heat transfer from the ball of water to the surrounding so the surrounding acts as a reservoir so there is not much change in the temperature that uh, the, or might not change the temperature in the freezer so despite the removal of heat the temperature of the freezer remains the same now once the heat is removed there is a consequent decrease in the temperature of in the ball of water and this brings about the change in the state of the water so when you consider from the perspective of the ball of water when you consider within the ball of water when you, when you look um, just consider the system that is a ball of water the driving force that brings about the solidification the driving force that brings about the freezing is the depth in the temperature of the water that is brought about by the heat transfer so therefore the driving force can be directly when it in the framework or within the ball of water the driving force can be attributed to this temperature difference this temperature in the ball of water in the same way when we consider a change in the state of the system within in a laboratory 
and and that change is brought about by either change in the temperature or change in the pressure within the material the driving force can be attributed to the corresponding thermodynamic function that is the gibbs free energy so even though externally you are heating up the system under a different pressure when you consider within the material when you want to describe the um driving force within the material then it can so it can be done using this particular or associated thermodynamic function which is the gibbs free energy when you consider the expression for the gibbs free energy or change in the gibbs free energy when temperature and pressure changes it is expressed as minus s dt plus p or rather v dp now when you restrict your discussion to the change in the state of the material when the pressure is constant so what you are doing is you are considering or you are considering a material so uh, to just move away from our uh, conventional uh, assumption of uh, a ball of water let us consider you have a solid block with you and you are eating that solid block above or till uh, or rather above its melting point in order to see how it melts so this you are doing in a laboratory setup and in such a case even though you are raising the temperature of the solid block you are assuming or you are doing it in the atmospheric pressure so therefore the only variable that rather governs the driving force for the change in the state of this block of metal is this term here since you are performing this experiment this melting at uh, uh, in a laboratory and a normal condition we assume this occurs at the constant atmospheric pressure so therefore this term here vanishes off and ultimately the change in the state of the system can be discussed based on the change in the gibbs free energy particularly with respect to the temperature or exclusively with respect to the temperature now given this expression when we plot the change in the gibbs free energy with respect to the temperature from this expression we saw in our previous lecture it is possible for us to understand how the curve that relates gibbs free energy and temperature looks like so first of all we i we it, um, it, there is expression indicates that there is a negative sign on the or in this expression we have a negative sign on the right hand side term or the right hand side of the expression so it means the relation between gibbs free energy and the temperature has a negative slope so the first feature one can understand about the relation between the gibbs free energy and the temperature from this relation is it has a negative slope secondly when you quantify the slope that is the slope can be of this curve mathematically is nothing but g or the first derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to the temperature and from this expression it is nothing but minus of the entropy so the slope is nothing but when you quantify it it is nothing but the entropy of the system and finally in addition to the first derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to temperature it is possible for us to consider the higher order derivative that is the second derivative and when we consider the second derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to temperature from this expression we can state it is nothing but the change in the entropy with respect to temperature and finally it is nothing but or this can be related to a material constant that is heat capacity so what we essentially have is in addition to being able to relate the relation between gibbs free energy to or uh, and the temperature to a negative slope and quantify that slope and related to the corresponding entropy we it is also possible for us to understand from this expression that the higher order derivative particularly second derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to the temperature can be related to the property of the material the constant of the system and moreover since again numerically or from a purely mathematical perspective the second derivative of any curve it rather translates to the curvature it is possible for us 
to rather expect how the relation between Gibbs free energy and the temperature would be how the curve that relates Gibbs free energy and the temperature would be from our understanding of or based on the material constant. So the material constant entropy change it governs the material constant here is the heat capacity and the uh, entropy they both govern the nature of the relation between the Gibbs free energy and temperature so when you when we or when we say when i say the nature of the relation between gibbs free energy and temperature i mean the curve while the entropy dictates the slope of the curve the curvature of this particular curve is rather dictated by the material constant now considering that for when a material is in two different states particularly when a single component material when a unary material is in two different states solid and a liquid state and considering for each of these states the material constant particularly the heat capacity varies when we consider two different states of the system we give free energy and the temperature change in two state two different state of a given system it becomes evident that from these relations that we need to have two different curves okay because of this expression here it is possible for us to arrive at or it is possible for us to rather have an idea of how the curve that relates gibbs free energy with temperature looks like now this curve it depends on entropy and curvature depending on the state of a system even though we are considering a single system a depending on the state of the system the entropy and also the curvature at different temperatures so curvature what we mean by that is the material constant that is the heat capacity so the entropy and the heat capacity for a given system at different state it varies so therefore when we are considering the relation between the gibbs free energy and temperature for a system in two different states then we need to consider two different curves so when we do that so the first idea is we need to consider two different curves so let us consider the solid curve in blue and the liquid curve in red now so this is the liquid curve and the solid curve is in blue now that there is a specific reason why when you consider the combination of solid and liquid curve it needs to adopt this particular form here so this can be understood when you consider the canonical expression for the Gibbs free energy which is nothing but enthalpy minus temperature and entropy. So this is one way of describing the Gibbs free energy. When you describe it in this way, the role of entropy is associated with the role of entropy is associated with the temperature. So when we say that you have combination of two thermodynamic variables or you have this combination of the different thermodynamic variables and function and you are focusing on the entropy here because entropy is the one that governs the slope of this curve that rather quantifies the slope of the curve now the role of the entropy is associated with the temperature now as the temperature increases the role of the entropy also proportionately increases so that is what we understand from this expression here so the, the, the curve that relates gibbs free energy and temperature the curve of this or the slope of this curve is dependent on the entropy however the dominance or the influence of the entropy progressively increases with temperature now when you consider solid and liquid the entropy if you discuss entropy as the degree of randomness in case of solids since we are largely focusing on the crystalline solid in crystalline solids since the atoms have specific position the degree of randomness that can be achieved in solid is often less than the degree of randomness that can be achieved in liquid wherein there is no such specific atomic positions you have solid wherein you have specific atomic position you have liquids not not so well declared atomic positions so when you want to introduce rather randomness it is more easily or the more randomness can be introduced in liquid when compared to that of solid so therefore the entropy in liquid is often higher when compared to that of solid and that means 
the slope, the negative slope of the liquid curve will be higher when compared to the solid beyond a specific temperature. So even though the entropy of liquid is higher than that of solid, but since the role of the entropy, it becomes dominant or the dominance of the entropy it depends on the temperature, only after a specific temperature you observe that the slope of the liquid curve is greater than it becomes greater than that of the slope of the solid curve. So this change in the slope of the uh, liquid curve when compared to that of the solid curve ultimately allows the liquid curve to assume a position that is beneath the solid curve. So because the entropy of the liquid at higher temperature or the entropy of the liquid is higher than that of the solid and this factor becomes dominant at higher temperature you have the slope of the liquid higher than that of the solid, solid behind a specific temperature. The temperature beyond which the liquid has or it exhibits a higher entropy when compared to that of the solid or um, the temperature at beyond which the slope of the liquid curve is greater than that of the solid curve is the melting temperature. So, in both liquids and liquid and solid or when compared in irrespective of the temperature when you compare the entropy between liquid and solid it is often the entropy of the liquid is higher than that of the solid however the dominance depends on the temperature and beyond a specific temperature only there is this because of this dominant dominance the liquid curve is beneath that of the solid curve and this temperature beyond which you have the liquid curve beneath the solid curve is the melting point. Now when you consider the Gibbs free energy and now having considered uh, why beyond this point or how what makes um, the liquid curve assume a position beneath the solid curve beyond this point when you consider the Gibbs free energy we saw that in the framework of second law of thermodynamics for a spontaneous change to occur the Gibbs free energy the change in the Gibbs free energy should be less than zero. So what we mean by here is the difference between the end product to that of the um, original or the initial product. So this change in the Gibbs free energy, the difference in the Gibbs free energy between the end product to that of the final product. So end product here. So a better way of expressing this would be delta G. This should be less than zero. This we arrive from the second law of thermodynamics. And here the delta G is the difference between the Gibbs free energy of the end product here it is liquid and the original or the initial product which is the solid. So beyond the melting point when you consider at, at temperature T that is greater than the melting point the delta G is less than zero for this expression here. So you have your Gibbs free energy whenever when you move above the melting point the Gibbs free energy of the liquid is less than the Gibbs free energy of the solid and therefore the change in the Gibbs free energy is less than zero. So ultimately what you have is a spontaneous change in the state of the system. So you are assuming a solid block you are raising the temperature of the solid block beyond the melting point then thermodynamically what essentially uh, what happens is the Gibbs free energy of the solid block particularly the Gibbs, the, the Gibbs free energy of uh, the liquid assumes a value that is less than the Gibbs free energy of the solid. So the, in its solid state the energy of the system is higher now and there is a new position for the material to move towards. There is a possibility of the material to reduce its energy that is by changing its state. So thermodynamically when you want to discuss or describe the process of melting what we have is you have a material in a stable state you increase the temperature of the material beyond its melting point then you are establishing a new state for the system a new stable state for the system. And this new stable state can be achieved by changing its state by melting and therefore the material the solid material melts and assumes the new stable state because the 
energy of this new stable state in its liquid form is much less than the energy of the solid material. So thermodynamically, you are introducing a new low energy state, a new stable state and the state of the system corresponding to this particular equilibrium condition is liquid and therefore the system changes its states from solid to liquid. So you have a system in solid condition, you raise the temperature of the system beyond a specific point and after a specific point it is possible for the system to reduce its energy and assume a low energy state and this is possible by system changing from solid to liquid and therefore the system solid changes from solid to liquid spontaneously because the spontaneous condition is satisfied so the system spontaneously changes from solid to liquid thereby achieving a change in the state now when you consider so instead of moving in this direction that is towards or increasing the temperature if we reduce the temperature if for instance we have uh, a metal that is liquid at room temperature and we are progressively reducing its temperature when we do that beyond certain temperature that is beyond certain temperature when the Gibbs free energy of the solid is rather less than Gibbs free energy of the liquid. So in a stable state the system is in the liquid condition and now you are gradually decreasing the temperature and beyond the temperature there is a possibility for the system to reduce its energy and in order to do that the system must change from liquid to solid and therefore the system spontaneously changes from liquid to solid because of this difference in or this possibility of reducing its energy and this is the driving force for or this is what we refer to as the solidification and be below the melting point the change in the Gibbs free energy that drives the change in the state of the system from liquid to solid can be expressed as solid which is the end state minus the liquid which is the initial state and this being less than zero we have fulfilled the condition for the spontaneous change and ultimately what we have is a transition from the solid or rather liquid to that of solid so we have a specific temperature above which there is one state that has a low energy that as low gives free energy or that, that assumes low gives free energy and there is and below that temperature we have another state that assumes low energy or low gives free energy so therefore depending on which of the state assumes the low free energy the system moves towards that state so beyond the melting point you have liquid that is of low gives free energy and uh, uh, rather uh, below the melting point you have solid that is of the low free energy so therefore given this difference in the free energies we have the material assuming a liquid state beyond the melting point and below the melting point it assumes a solid state now when you consider or the this transition at specific temperature for instance you begin you, uh, you consider your system at t1 and you immediately drop it to t2 and you hold it for or you are you are not progressively decreasing from t1 to t2 but directly you are dropping it to t2 and you are observing the change in the state of the material then what you observe is you observe a change in the state of the system from liquid to solid and from the material perspective the driving force here is the difference in the Gibbs free energy which can be quantified by dropping a straight line and considering the difference in the Gibbs free energy so this is the Gibbs free energy of the liquid and this is the Gibbs free energy of the solid at the specific temperature and at the specific temperature at the specific temperature T2 it is the difference between the Gibbs free energy of the solid at T2 minus the Gibbs free energy of the liquid at that specific temperature so T2 yeah so in this case what we have is the solidification is governed by the difference in 
the gibbs free energy the driving force can be related to from the material perspective the driving force can be related to the difference in the gibbs free energy so depending on at what temperature are we considering the solidification it now becomes possible for us to rather estimate the driving force that governs the solidification so depending on the temperature the driving force correspondingly varies now when you consider the difference in the gibbs free energy at this particular point here where the two curves meet here the difference in the gibbs free energy is zero so at the melting point the difference in the gibbs free energy is zero so we have considered all the three possibilities one is the temperature greater than the melting point temperature less than the melting point and now the temperature at the melting point and in this case the difference in the gibbs free energy is zero that means there is not sufficient driving force for the system to change its states so therefore both solid and liquid it is possible at this given point for the both liquid and solid to be in equilibrium so that is what the melting point indicates so melting point indicates a state or a condition wherein both liquid and solid so what we are attempting to do is we are attempting to describe so far we have been we are attempting to describe the change in the state of the systems thermodynamically so we are not talking about uh, the melting as the atoms which were originally placed in a specific position losing their position and getting moved away from a speci specific position we are not talking atomistically or we are not considering that the crystal structure is lost and we are not considering or in the ultimately you have the liquids forming we are not talking about in the in a microscopic condition we cannot we are not talking stating that we have uh, specific grains or specific uh, form of uh, solid material that is lost after the melting point so we are not talking in the microscopic scale what we have been doing is we have been using this curve to describe thermodynamically the melting process thermodynamically we have been using to this curve to describe the solidification process in the same way it is possible for us to describe the melting point in from the thermodynamic perspective as well so from a thermodynamic perspective the melting point is a temperature at which both the liquid and the solid can be or can stay in a stable condition can be with equilibrium with one another because the difference between the gibbs free energy of the solid and the gibbs free energy of the liquid are both equivalent so in this at the melting point the gibbs free energy of the solids and the gibbs free energy of the liquids are equivalent and therefore there is no driving force to govern this transition so ultimately both these state they remain at equilibrium at this temperature so we have been able to thermodynamically discuss what solidification is on what melting is and what a melting temperature is now from this particular curve here so what we have is we have considered the gibbs energy and temperature relation for the solid and the liquid now if you want to rather plot the relation or that governs the state of the system so here below this and below this temperature here below the melting point this section of the liquid curve is rather hypothetical so this section of the liquid curve is doesn't play any role in the physical world except for us to estimate the thermodynamic driving force it doesn't play any significant role this this extension of this liquid curve is hypothetical and it helps us to rather estimate the driving force from apart from that in the physical world this section of the liquid curve doesn't play much of a role and the same goes for this section of the solid curve so beyond the melting point this section of the solid curve doesn't play a actual role in the physical world because beyond the melting point for a constant pressure all that you observe is in the physical world all that you observe is liquid and in the same way below the melting point for a given material all that you observe is a solid and we whenever we talk about liquid below the melting point it's just an hypothetical it's just an metastable state 
so it's just a theoretical consideration so when you give a purely practical consideration to the curve that you have and then you see what is the actual gibbs free energy and temperature curve for a given material as the temperature moves beyond the melting point so what is the curve that actually dictates the state of the system so what is the curve that actually governs the state of the system in this temperature range then again from a physical world perspective it is the this curve which has the lowest gibbs free energy so we have section of a liquid curve and a section of the solid curve that are purely theoretical that are purely hypothetical and that are that we consider only in the thermodynamic framework to discuss or to describe the driving force that govern the change in the state of the system so those sections of these curves are these two from a purely practical standpoint from a purely laboratory setting whenever we consider or if we have to consider the change in the state of the system then we need to consider only this red curve here so when you consider how a system varies with respect to a temperature despite its change in state then the system follows this particular curve so what i'm doing is i'm just reproducing this red curve here so the system follows this particular curve here and here what we have is our melting point so during melting or during solidification when the system follows this particular relation between gibbs free energy and temperature all the other sections of these curves are rather purely from a thermodynamic point of view purely from a theoretical point of view but from a practical standpoint when you consider what is the free energy and temperature relation the system follows for this range of temperature it is the one that is shown in red so below the melting point it follows the curve that is that is a part of the solid curve and above the melting point it follows a curve that is part of the liquid curve this is primarily because below the melting point it is the solid that is in its stable state and above the melting point it is the liquid which is in its stable state so therefore the material as a whole from a practical standpoint the it follows rather this particular trend where you have a sharp transition at the melting point so when you consider the nature of this curve similarly like we consider the nature of the simple gibbs free energy versus temperature curve for a single state so when we consider initially the change in the gibbs free energy with respect to the temperature we assumed it to be as smooth as this and we considered several features even in this lecture we consider there can be several features attributed to this curve however when we consider that particular this rather uh, curve here wherein we attributed it to or from wherein we understood the several or characteristic feature of this curve from this relation here we did not include any change in the phases but when you introduce a change in the phase particularly the concept of melting and solidification like we have one considered here then we end up with a curve like this wherein there is a sharp transition often at the melting point so there is a sharp transition at the melting point because below the melting point the curve follows the solid curve and above the melting point it follows the liquid curve therefore since solid and liquid they have two different entropies and they have two different both entropies and also the heat capacities there is often a sharp transition and for this reason the transition that is change in the state of the uh, a material from solid to liquid or liquid to solid it is referred to as the discontinuous transformation and again the reason we refer to this as a discontinuous transformation because unlike this curve here 
which we consider for a single system that does not experience a single material that does, uh, a single component material a unary material that, uh, that does not experience a change in state it is smooth and it is continuous but when there is a change in state so when there is a transformation occurring what we observe is a sharp a transition from in the curve above and below the melting point and this we refer to as the discontinuous and because of this sharp transition because of the introduction of a discontinuity here a region wherein it is not smooth it is not rather differentiable from a mathematical standpoint from a numerical standpoint this point here is not easily differentiable so therefore we refer to the transformation the overall change in the state be it melting and solidification we refer to it as the discontinuous transformation now when you plot the slope of this particular curve here which is nothing but the entropy and the temperature when you plot the slope of this curve what you observe is you have a specific slope that is attributed to that of the entropy of the solid and there is a certain increase in that slope that is attributed to the liquid so till here so this is the melting point below the melting point the slope of the curve it indicates the entropy of the solid and above the melting point you have the slope of the curve that is indicative of the entropy of the liquid so therefore there is a discontinuity in the first order in the first order derivative there is a discontinuity which is evident here so when you plot the first order so the entropy is nothing but the first order derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to the temperature so when you plot the first order derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to temperature this discontinuity which we observe in the gibbs free energy versus temperature curve becomes more evident here so therefore this change in the state of the system is also referred to as the first order transformation so what you essentially have is for considering to discuss the change in the state of the system how the gibbs free energy changes we have considered one example so one transformation we have considered so that is melting or solidification so in case of melting or solidification below the melting point it is the gibbs free energy of the solid that is low so therefore the curve that governs the state of the system is it coincides with the free energy curve of the solid and above the melting point the free energy curve of the liquid is the lowest so therefore the material it adapts th that particular section of the liquid free energy curve so ultimately you end up with a curve like this that dictates the um, state of the system as the temperature increases now when you consider the nature of this curve at the melting point here there is a discontinuity that is introduced so in this curve itself it is possible for us to understand there is a non differentiable point at this at the melting temperature and now so therefore there is a a sharp change so there is a discontinuity that is introduced there is a, a non differentiable so we cannot differentiate at this point so there is there is a sharp transition so therefore it is possible for us to refer to this transition at this melting point as a discontinuous transition in addition to that this discontinuity becomes more evident when you consider the first derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to the temperature and when you see, when you observe the uh, the change in the first derivative of the gibbs free energy with respect to temperature at the melting point we observe there is a significant or noticeable discontinuity and because of this reason we refer to this particular form of transformation where we observe a solid state transforming into a liquid state or liquid to a solid state as a discontinuous transformation or a first order transformation just one point to note here when you consider um, the this particular discussion or when you look into this particular discussion in uh, the other uh, often referred uh, book uh, by gaskell there is a bit of inaccuracy here so please be uh, wary of it so while discussing the first order transformation or the discontinuous transformation particularly while discussing uh, 
this particular uh, this uh, representation this change in the Gibbs free energy there has been or uh, there is an inaccuracy if I'm not wrong in Gaskell's book so please be aware of it now moving ahead if the question is so in addition to the discontinuous transformation there should be a possibility given uh, its uh, terminology that we use but there should be a possibility for us to have a transformation that is rather continuous so the concept of discontinuity or uh, our understanding of the discontinuous transformation it initially stems from the change in the Gibbs free energy the system adapts when it changes its states because there is a sharp change in the slope of this curve here which the system adapts as you increase the temperature we began to refer to it as the discontinuous transformation now supposing if such we observe for instance a change that is rather continuous uh, a slope that is rather continuous despite the change in the state of the system for instance let us uh, begin with the considering a final rather the change in the Gibbs free energy of the system with respect to temperature irrespective of a state so despite the uh, change in the state you the, the change in the Gibbs free energy with respect to temperature that you observe is something like this so you observe the change in the temp uh, Gibbs free energy with respect to temperature it is something like this now when you consider the Gibbs free energy of the solid if it is of this form so this is the Gibbs free energy of the solid and if this is the rather uh, this is the Gibbs free energy of the liquid and here you have your transition so let us again this is purely an imaginary uh, condition so in, in uh, at t prime you have your transition and when you consider the curve that the system adapts despite the change in the state that you observe the curve is rather continuous when you compare it with this curve here so there are also transformation possible wherein the curve is smooth despite the transition and such transformation as opposed to the one here we refer to it as the continuous transformation and when you plot the first derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to temperature and it is rather uh, one can understand how it would look like from the red curve here it would rather be continuous and therefore such transformations are called as continuous transformation or second order transformation again as opposed to solidification or melting wherein during the transition there is a sharp change in the slope of the Gibbs free energy curve with respect to temperature it is also possible for us to have a transformation wherein the slope is change in the slope is not abrupt but gradual so when you have a change in the slope that is not abrupt but gradual what you essentially observe or essentially what it means is that there is a continuous change in the Gibbs free energy that governs the state of the system so unlike here wherein, wherein there is a discontinuous change in the Gibbs free energy that governs the state of the system here there is a continuous change so therefore the transformation rather occurs rather smoothly and therefore such transformation are referred to as the continuous transformation now on the in addition to that the new plot a similar curve that indicates the change in the slope of the curve with respect to temperature since all these points here are differentiable you will not observe any such discontinuities and therefore ultimately you end up having a constant curve that represents the first derivative of the Gibbs free energy with respect to temperature and the temperature so therefore it is smooth in the first order so therefore it is referred to as the second order transformation so okay, second order phase transformation so what we have seen so far is it is possible for us to consider the Gibbs free energy of the system not of the state but of the system as a whole that dictates its state so that is what gives us this red curve here and based on that we will be able to state if a transformation is associated or it's included in this curve if the transformation is included in this curve it is possible for us to state if the transformation is a continuous one or a discontinuous one so with this i would like to wind this lecture up and in the subsequent lecture we will 
rather build on this understanding and uh, we will try to understand uh, we will try to relate this to phase equilibria goodbye